Hello and a warm welcome to all attendees joining today's webinar, which is titled Oracle Forms to Cloud. So be assured this will be a great webinar filled with great content. And like always, we do have some excellent speaker lined up and I'm happy that all of you can join the session. Interesting that this is a topic that has gained more and more attention over the past month. And this topic is on many people's mind. What do I do with my work of forms that my organization relies heavily on? So today we are talking about that current option like cloud and we will demonstrate how to ease using Oracle Forms in cloud environment. All of this is an excellent target state option in terms of ongoing usage and involvement of Oracle Forms. That said, presenters that we have lined up for today, first top is Michael Ferrante. Principal Product Manager from Oracle. So very excited to hear him speak today. And Michael has a first session talking about Oracle Forms and Cloud, and he will demonstrate how easy and fast get a Forms environment running in cloud. So fast and straightforward, all within a live presentation and a couple of minutes. So awesome. Moreover, he will speak, of course, about Oracle Marketplace and walk with us through this process. Welcome, Michael. We also have Stefan LaRocca, my colleague who heads up business development at PIPS, and Stefan will share our view on customer benefits and project experience. This will be based on some sample for PITS and PITSCON development tasks, means maintaining and development in the cloud. And myself, Sasha Sander, it's a pleasure for me to moderate and take you through a quick tour through the PITS session. At the end of the session, we have reserved uh, some time we will close with a Q&A. So we already had a number of questions that a lot of you have asked during the registration process. And we're gonna address these at the end. Anyway, if you have any questions that may arise during the session, so please, please use the possibility, um, place your question uh, in the chat or the use of the Q&A button and the webinar app. Somewhere uh, should be at the top of the screen Definitely, you'll find it quite easy. Feel free to place your questions here to be discussed and answered in the Q&A session. So what are we talking about within the next 40 minutes? What are we discussing today is, of course, talk about Oracle Forms and Cloud, uh, but we'd like to give answers to questions and demonstrate the easiest way to bring Forms applications to Cloud. We demonstrate what new possibilities uh, the migration to the cloud opens up for your organization and probably your everyday work as well. But also, what do you have to pay attention to when using Oracle Forms in the cloud? And of course, we take in account all of your questions and everything. Just a quick hint uh, at this day, time, uh, as you probably have seen in our invitation, we have prepared a webinar special uh, especially for all attendees here joining uh, today. Uh, so we have the possibility um, that you have a chance to test uh, full functionality of, of our tool set in the cloud uh, for a 30 day free of charge. Um, yeah, stay, stay curious. I will emphasize a bit more during the session. I'm pretty sure most of you know PITS already. In the past, it's PITSCon, and, and PITS has been around since 99. And even if this is the case, uh, just a quick update about PITS. So PITS is working globally directly from our headquarter in Germany with two locations targeting the UK market out of London with PITS UK. Uh, since 2007, already in the Americas with the daughter company PITS LLC of Toronto, Michigan. So we are truly a global company. Moreover, collaborating in various regions with dedicated and certified PITS partners, providing our solution and expert services in their regions. Well, we are international, uh, we are very expertized. We have senior resources that can help out in native time. On top of that, our huge expertise around and ahead or out. We are doing very exciting projects, modernization from forms, within forms, from reports, within reports, or to other technologies such as APEX ADF, 
And as a leading provider of tools for Oracle, we work successfully with hundreds of companies internationally. We perform performs modernization, analyzes complex projects, ongoing development, all based on our solution pit stop. Well, as a long-standing Oracle partner, we are very busy in the forms community, joining directly or together with partners a lot of events. We run a lot of presentations. So whenever you have a chance to join, uh, chance to join an event, please take a look for Pits. We'd be happy to welcome you to one of our booths. Our expertise, including our solution and products, are not just working on PowerPoint only. And uh, especially with Pitscon, we have many, many very happy customers around the globe with more than 500 successful projects in more than 40 countries. So we support our customers up to a 360 degree view, including a full stack team support that brings a huge expertise in projects, including a fantastic and unique tool set Pits proven in multiple hundreds of projects and all based on an excellent methodology that guarantees project success right from the first step. Well, so far, uh, a quick update. So, but before I hand over to, to Mike, let's take the opportunity for a quick poll, please. It's always important to see what you guys are using currently. And we do present the results of the poll directly after. So uh, I'm pretty sure that this is definitely also interesting for you. Uh, we have prepared this quick poll and appreciate uh, if you uh, answer this one. Just tick the box, really your action required here. I see that you're very busy. Thank you for answering. Okay, move forward. Just a quick countdown, then it's five, four, three, two, one, and we'll end this. Thank you very much. And just have a look at the results. You should see it. Yeah, it's interesting results. So I'm, I'm really excited as we do have more than 200 registration for this web session. Again, I think it's quite representative of thought. So more than 50% already running on 12C, a uh, few still on Form 6, uh, minor ones still on older than Form 6, but most already really on 12C environment. That's cool. Good. Okay. So. That said, we will go ahead and turn over to Mike to present the first part of the presentation. So Mike, please take over and, and go ahead, please. Well, thank you so much. Let's see if we could share my screen. Hopefully everybody knows me. Um, if not, you'll get to know me here in the next few seconds or so. I am a product manager for Oracle's application development tools team. Um, in addition to Oracle Forms, we're also responsible for some of the more modern tools like Visual Builder Cloud Service. But again, I think hopefully most everyone uh, knows me. A lot of the content I'm going to share right now, I actually presented at DOAG uh, back in November out in Germany, but I have updated it a little bit because there have been some updates since then. But basically, it's the same concept. Um, We've shortened down the content a little bit just to make it flow a little faster and just simply um, in the interest of time, we want to make sure you get as much information as we can. So let me go ahead and go forward real quick. So again, I am uh, a product manager out at Oracle, um, specifically uh, focused on the Forms product. And these days with everything being cloud, we figure we need to get into the game as well. So we're going to talk about a little of that today. I am also going to talk about the the roadmap ahead of Forms 12, so I have to share the safe harbor statement with you, which basically says that this is just for informational purposes, and we cannot guarantee any of the information that I'm saying here will actually hold true in the future because business plans do change. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to look at uh, is exactly that, Forms in Cloud, then I'm actually going to demonstrate it, and again, I'm going to talk about the roadmap beyond Forms 12 and then I will hand it back over to the PITS team. So 
again, let's take a look at cloud. And again, I, I said for many of you that have seen me before, we've looked at these, these slides, although they've been updated just a little bit, but I'm gonna show you how easy this is to get from your current forms on premise environment and into cloud um, where everything is up and running pretty quickly. So the first thing you're gonna need or want is a, uh, an Oracle cloud account. If you don't already have one, uh, you certainly can take advantage of the free trial offer that we have, which allows you up to 30 days uh, in cloud, uh, as well as along with any software as well, with no additional licensing fees. So for the first up to 30 days, uh, depending upon how you use it, you'll have access to cloud. So great place to try it uh, at no risk to you. Just cancel, just stop using it at any time and you're good to go. After you have an account, you'll go to the cloud marketplace, which uh, I'll explain in just a second. Basically, it's it's similar to the Google Play Store or Apple App Store. Um, you go into this environment, you find an application or an uh, environment that you want, you click on get it, and we will do the rest of the work for you. That's what we're gonna illustrate here. Again, you'll, you'll go out to a uh, you'll be delivered to a page where you're provided all the information about what you're about to get, and effectively you'll click on the Get App button, and it'll take you through the process. And like many of our cloud instances, the first thing you have to do is connect to it with an SSH session, and in our case, what will happen is the provisioning uh, process will continue where version 19 database will be uh, set up for you, as well as the Fusion Middleware software that you're actually interested in. We have chosen to use the cloud infrastructure environment or OCI. It is a completely customer managed environment. So once this instance spins up, it's entirely yours to do with however you please. If you don't like what we did, you could delete what we did and start over. You could alter what we did. It is entirely up to you under the limitations of whatever your licensing in terms of use agreement uh, tells you. Okay. So let's actually dive into a demonstration real quick. So. Uh, what we're going to need is a web browser because we're going to do pretty much what I just said. The only thing we're not going to do is create the cloud account. We're going to assume you already have one. So what we're going to do is we're going to start from cloud marketplace. So cloudmarketplace.oracle.com. And I'm going to do exactly like I said on that slide. I'm going to search for forms and click on go. And hopefully one of the first responses when I type it correctly will be forms. And you can see the very first response here or search result is forms. I'm gonna click on forms. And it takes me to the page that I mentioned, which has the get app button. Uh, on this page, it actually indicates that this is a bring your own license environment, which means after 30 days, if you wanna continue using it, it's your responsibility to ensure you have the proper licensing to use that software. Um, I do highly recommend that you take a few moments, not right now, but uh, when you do it yourself, to read uh, this usage information. It explains what you're getting, how to use it, how to gain access to it. It also talks about things like uh, Oracle Reports is installed but not configured and explains why. There are some screenshots on the bottom uh, if you're interested in just checking out. Those are down there. And then of course, uh, documentation that you may need along the way is also listed there, as well as the readme file that is included in the instance once you provision it. This update that we're looking at right now is brand new. We just published it yesterday. So uh, this will actually be one of the first times I run this uh, as it has become public facing. So this should be pretty fun, okay? Uh, in the updated 12214 uh, box, if you wanna call it that, uh, there's an Oracle JDK version 8241 and a bunch of other stuff. We'll go through that list in just a second, but I just wanted to show you that some of the stuff was updated. So as I mentioned, this is simple. We're gonna click on get app and we're gonna go forward. From here, we're gonna choose the region where we want our environment, environment to be provisioned. For me, I'm on the East Coast of the United States. So I'm gonna choose the East Coast and I'm gonna click sign in. This is one last chance. If you don't already have an account, you could actually create one over on the right side, but I do have an account. So I'm gonna click on sign in. It's gonna ask me to sign in, which I'm going to do. And then it's gonna bring me to a page, somewhat of a summary page, uh, effectively explaining exactly what it just explained on the other page, only in a slightly different format. Again, if you did not read the information uh, about the usage instructions, I strongly recommend you look at this. The blue text in here uh, are hyperlinks, so if there's any topic that you don't 
fully understand or you're not familiar with, take advantage of this time to look at this information because you will need it. Um, we've had a lot of questions with customers saying, hey, I provisioned an instance and I don't have access to it. Why not? That's all explained right here. Okay. So you want to take advantage of that. You do have availability of uh, 12214 of Fusion Middleware or 12213. However, I strongly recommend you use 12214, which is the latest. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the compartment, um, but uh, it, the information about what, what a compartment is and why you would or would not have one is explained in the documentation I mentioned. You're going to agree to the terms of use. And again, it mentions BYOL, bring your own license. And you're going to click on launch. On this page, you're going to provide it some customizations that are unique to you. In this particular case, we're going to start with the instance name. The instance name does become the host name of the machine that you're creating, so you'll want to not use blank spaces or special characters. So let's say, for example, I name this Pitts Demo will become my host name. It reminds you what you're installing. The availability domain, again, I'm not going to go too much into detail about this. We are creating a virtual machine. And then I could choose the shape of the machine um, that I want. Listed will be all the shapes that are supported. And you can see the very first one by default is a 1.0 CPU machine with 15 gig of RAM. Perfectly sufficient for uh, basic operation. Because we're doing a demo and we're, we're limited on time, I'm going to choose this super machine, 24 CPU with 320 gig of RAM, which I only wish I had one of those myself. So I'm going to go ahead and choose that one so this runs a little bit quicker. And I'm going to click Select Shape. And then we're going to scroll down and select a virtual cloud network. And I'll explain what that is in just a second. And I'm going to assign it a public address. One thing you will need to do, one thing you will need to do before you start uh, this process is have a public-private uh, SSH key already set up. Uh, I already have that. And again, information on how to create your own if you don't have one is explained in the usage instructions. So I'm going to grab my public key, we're going to put that into the cloud instance because I'll need the private key to connect from my machine to that cloud later. And now I'm going to click on create. And for the most part, that's it. That's the most complicated information you'll be presented with. The rest of it is pretty much automated. The only step left is going to be to provide it passwords uh, for this custom image you're about to create. For example, the database password and the WebLogic Server Administrator password, and so on. And we'll do that in just a second after the instance is actually up and running. So while we're doing that, while we're waiting for that to happen, I'm going to go ahead and switch back to the slides. Um, we'll just switch back over, put that in the background. And we'll press forward. So I started to mention what was in the box, and I held myself back because I wanted to go through it here. But what you're going to get in the box or in the installation is that readme file that I mentioned. It's a copy of it, so it's the same. Uh, it is stored in the, the OPC user's home directory, which is the default user that's created for all of our uh, cloud instances. Oracle Public Cloud is what that stands for. It's also available on the Linux desktop. We do have uh, you know, full X server running here, and desktop is available, so that if you wanted to take advantage of things like the form builder or any of the other tools with a UI, you'll be able to VNC to this machine and have that desktop. Again, the installation locations are in this file. So for example, where is the database? Where is the WebLogic server installation? Where is the JDK that you mentioned? All of that is explained in there. Access information, so like I described earlier, now that I've connected to this thing and I've got this SSH session going, how in the world do I use it? How do I get to Fusion Middleware Control? How do I get to all the tooling? Um, it's all going to be explained in there, as well as usernames, passwords, and that kind of stuff. And again, links to related documentation. Again, in the box is JDK uh, 8241. It is installed or staged separately of the Fusion Middleware environment. So if you want to directly update the JDK that's in the Fusion Middleware environment, you could use this a copy of this to do that. Um, the installation is performed with this 241, but the JDK that lives in the installation is the, uh, the default one that comes with it, which I believe is 8 uh, update 211. We do install a database 19.3 for you. Um, however, keep in mind, it, it upon 
installation is not set up for anything. There is no Scott schema in it. There's nothing in it except for access through sys or system. So you'll want to set that up for your application once uh, once you get it up and going. WebLogic Server Infrastructure 12214 is set up and a domain is created for you. Forms and reports is installed. However, reports is not configured. Um, the decision to do that was partially based around the idea that reports has been deprecated and we really want to encourage you to use BI Publisher or Analytics Cloud Service. If you decide you want to use reports, that is entirely up to you. Just bear in mind, it has not been tested or certified by Oracle, so you're doing it a little bit at your own risk. Support for using it may be limited. SQL Developer 19.4 is set up in the Oracle home uh, where Forms is found. Um, we did that for two reasons. One, so that you have access to this new and useful tool, and two, because it's also used by the Forms application deployment services. So we wanted to make sure you had the latest version in there available to you. Upon completion, the database, OHS, WS Forms, FADS, Forms Application Deployment Services, are all configured and running. So you don't have to worry about, you know, where do I find the script to start and stop things? You know, how do I get this going? It will be running as soon as the provisioning is completed. If you happen to reboot the machine, all of the processes will start up automatically for you. Uh, it does take a couple minutes to get started up, but it will start up automatically for you. So I mentioned the virtual cloud network. Um, this is something that realistically you're going to want to set up before you do before you do this provisioning. However, you don't have to do it that way. Um, you certainly could do it after the fact, but by default, port 22 will be the only open port to the public. The only open port to the public. That is an important fact because by just design, you're just accustomed to accessing, for example, Fusion Middleware Control on port 7001. You will not be able to directly do that out of the box. You have to make a decision on how you want to connect to it. Do you want to expose port 7001 to the public? Do you want to enable SSL? Do you want to use tunneling? And I'm going to show you all of those options, or at least some of those options, in just a second. For the sake of this demonstration, I have exposed port 777 in my virtual cloud network that I'm using for this demonstration so that upon this provisioning, uh, we'll be able to access this instance um, from any web browser in the world. So once I get this up and running, you'll be able to, from your desk right now, as soon as this is done, you'll be able to access the same exact thing that I'm accessing, which is kind of cool. The last line uh, in this table is uh, an entry that's made so that if I have multiple instances in my virtual cloud network, they will be able to talk to each other behind the firewall. So let's say, for example, instance one has forms on it, and instance two has database cloud service. Well, I want my forms application to be able to talk to database cloud service, but I want it to be able to do it privately on the private network. That will allow me to do that. Okay. So before we go a whole lot further, let's switch back to here. And you'll see that um, on the web page, um, I was given a private and a public address. I'm going to take the public address and I'm going to go into a PuTTY session. Uh, I am on Windows, obviously, so I'm going to use PuTTY. You don't have to use PuTTY, but I'm going to. Um, in PuTTY, you'll find, uh, find that you'll need to set up, for example, that same, you'll have to plug in that private key. Remember I said we put a public key into the cloud instance. You'll need the private key that matches that to connect to this instance. Okay. I've also set up tunneling. I mentioned tunneling earlier. Uh, I add port 22 on here so that I could do things like SFTP through the SSH tunnel. I also added port 5901 as a tunnel so that I could do VNC connections to this instance. Uh, you could also add to this port 7001 so that you could get to Fusion Middleware Control without opening the network port and uh, making it accessible to the public. Obviously, you don't want to do that, so having a tunnel is a better approach, but here I didn't do that. So let's go ahead and open this up, and it says, are you sure you want to do this? And I do want to do this. And you can see right away I could connect to this cloud instance that's being built up behind the scenes for me, and I encourage you to take a look at what these rules say at the top, but it's important that you follow them. We do try to catch most uh, cases where you don't follow them, but it's important that you understand and follow them. So I'm going to go ahead and start plugging in some passwords. And you'll notice it tells me which display VNC is running on. Um, 
port or display one or 5901. We'll go ahead and we'll get the database going. It should take just a second or so. Uh, the RCU schema to which this is referring to is the WebLogic Server Infrastructure Repository. And then this is the admin server um, password. Now we do show you a timestamp relative to the server that this is running on. Uh, if you're interested, you could jot down the time. My expectation is that this will take approximately seven minutes to complete. So what is that, 1535? This should be complete roughly. At the time that that completed indication comes up, seven minutes from now, the database, WebLogic Server Infrastructure, and Forms will be installed, configured, running, and accessible by you. In fact, OHS will be running also in seven minutes. Now, again, it's going to be seven minutes in my case because I chose a 24 CPU machine. On a one CPU machine, it takes approximately 11 to 12 minutes. So not quite double the amount of time, but almost. Okay. So let's go back to the slides. So conceptually, conceptually, here's what we're designing. Uh, we've got the little planet Earth there, which is going to represent everybody out in the public. And we've got a, a networking port, port 22, that's open, connecting to this instance on the back end um, on the Oracle Cloud area um, that will have a, a private address in the 10.0.0 subnet. If, for example, you wanted to gain access from the public facing side, you could open up a standard web port, let's say in our case 777, which is the default port for OHS, Oracle HTTP server. You don't have to use 777, I just use it simply because it's an example and it is the default for OHS, makes life a little easier for demonstration. On this cloud network, um, if you decide one instance isn't enough for you, maybe you want to load balance across multiple machines or you want to fail over, or maybe you just want something completely different on it, you certainly can provision another one and another one and as many as you want and have them all talk to each other or maybe not. Maybe you don't want them talking to each other. You could configure that as well. Likely, if you are not familiar with setting up a network, you will have to consult with a network administrator in your organization or refer to the documentation. Okay, this is going to be just standard networking functionality. There isn't any Oracle magic here. Um, we do allow uh, database cloud service uh, to be put on top of OCI or Oracle uh, Cloud Infrastructure, which allows you to do something like this. You could actually add database cloud service in the same network, which will do kind of what I described earlier, where if you want your individual instances of, say, forms, for example, to talk to the database uh, cloud service instance, you could do that. Now, again, the instance that we're creating right now already has a version 19 database in it that's used for the WebLogic Server repository. You can use that for your application data, or you can choose not to. That is entirely your choice. If you want to stand up another instance and install your own database, you could do that. If you want to use the database cloud service, you could do that as well. It is entirely your instance to do with as you please. If you decide you want to use BI Publisher or Analytics Cloud Service, you certainly could extend out to it. Um, developer Cloud Service, also an option once, uh, once you're in, this, um, in this, this type of environment. You could also use Developer Cloud Service from on-prem, but it certainly plays much better um, whilst, while in this space. And for people getting really creative and working on brand new projects, uh, Visual Builder Cloud Service is something to consider as well. We're not going to go too much into that. Uh, that's a whole other topic. So what are we going to do? We're going to switch back to the demonstration. So we probably have just a couple minutes to go. In the meantime, I'm going to go back here and kind of give you a walkthrough of what we have. And you can see, like I said, there's, <coughs> excuse me, there is a private network address that represents um, this instance that we're creating, the public address. And the reason there's a public address is because, if, I don't know if you remember, but during the questioning in the beginning where the instance name was, it asked me, do I want a public address? 
it's not going to be too often that you don't want a public address, um, but there certainly are going to be occasions where you might not. For example, let's say that database uh, instance that I talked about uh, being in your virtual cloud network. If there's no reason for the public to have access to your database directly, which in most cases there would not be, then you potentially would not use a public address. Right? You're going to want a back-end server to talk to your back-end database server, and that's it. Nobody in front of that should be allowed to get to it. So that's what that's for. So while the provisioning is finishing, the one thing I do know is that the VNC desktop is working. And I could connect right to it. I've got my VNC viewer already configured to connect to 5901 on localhost, which is what the tunneling does. And what you can see is I've got a pretty Linux desktop. I don't know if anyone has seen a Linux desktop before, but this is kind of what it looks like. The readme file that I talked about is here as well. You can see it's current. We just updated it. Like I said, this is brand new. And what's installed is here as well. And as we scroll down, what you'll see is information about security, the fact that there's no patches installed beyond what is noted. So if you have concerns about security patches and those kind of things, it's up to you to install them. We mentioned again that reports is here, but not configured. Installation guides are available. If you're looking for reports documentation, uh, you'll find it in the 12213 document set. You won't find any in 12214 because realistically there is no 12214 reports, even though it's included. And then as we scroll down, we are going to reiterate again that security is your responsibility. You're going to want to make sure that you prov provide or set up an SSL TLS certificate. Um, so as you connect to this, you're using the highest level of security. This is potentially open to the public if you choose it to be that way. And the locations of all the software on the machine, like I said, are explained here. So with the database home, the database connect string that was used to set up the repository database for WebLogic, the Oracle home for middleware, the domain for um, WebLogic server is also shown here. And the one thing you will notice is that the domains are not a subdirectory of the Oracle home. This is actually kind of one of those best practice tips um, to setting this up, to separate the two. I don't know if anybody heard it, but uh, in the background, I got a little dinging warning saying that we successfully provisioned. Uh, but let's go back real quick. Um, I do mention here that uh, port 777 and 4443 are open in the Linux firewall. This has no bearing on whether or not you could access this from the public. Until your virtual cloud network opens that either one of those ports or any port for that matter, you will not have access to this instance. So just because it's open in the Linux firewall does not mean that the public has access to this. Uh, but again, you'll want to refer to the security documentation of either Linux and or the cloud to understand fully how that works. In OHS, we have pre-configured for you or added the slash forms context route as well as FADS UI. We have not included Fusion Middleware Control or the WebLogic Server Console intentionally. Realistically, we would argue that accessing those tools from a public-facing URL is not a good idea. You can do it if you want, but generally speaking, it's not a good idea. We've also increased the OHS Keep Alive timeout from five seconds to 10 seconds. We found that we get the best performance out of forms and OHS um, in that scenario. The disk space by default um, is for this particular image is 75 gig. However, uh, if I were to show you right now, what you'll see is that there's only 40 gig available. That's typical of um, the way copying a VM works, a virtual machine. In order to gain back the missing disk space, just execute this command and reboot the machine and you'll see the full 75 gig. During provisioning, you're actually asked how big of a disk you want. If 75 gig is not large enough, you certainly could make it bigger than that. That's entirely your choice. But at the end, you'll still have to run this command to get beyond the 40 gig. Okay, so that's the document. I'm gonna exit from here and I'm gonna go back to my browser and I'm gonna show you Again, SSL is not enabled by default, so I don't have the luxury of uh, encryption, but you should see there's OHS's homepage. Okay. Again, I mentioned slash forms is already mapped for you, so I could do FRM servlet question mark and 
open big equals web start, and I should get the test form. Oops. Now keep in mind, if anybody's interested, um, I'm in the southeastern part of the country of the United States. This server, technically, is in the north, sort of the north central uh, part of the country. Uh, so it's quite a ways away from me. We're not necessarily right next to it. Uh, but the performance, generally speaking, is pretty good. Um, what I'm also going to do while we're here, while that's pulling the jar files down, I'm going to show you what we did in the Oracle, uh, in, the, in the OPC home directory. I had a little issue there for some reason. They always tell me don't do live demos. So in the user's home directory on this machine, you'll see that we created an Oracle subdirectory for you with a forms module directory. And out of the box, there's nothing in it. Um, what I wanna do real quickly is, I'm gonna show you how very quickly we could get modules up on that machine. And if we're running out of time, I'm gonna hand it back over to the PITS team. So I copied the machine's address. Uh, actually, I don't need that because I have a tunnel set up. So what I'm going to do is connect directly to the marketplace machine through my local host. I think it's not letting me connect to the cloud instance to run a form because of this web session I have going. But that's okay. We'll run it from the from the Linux machine. So here's my forms modules directory, same one I showed you on the Linux desktop. I'm going to copy this BI tester form, just literally drag and drop, and I'm going to move it from my local Windows machine here in South Central Florida. And that quickly, it's up on the cloud machine. We'll move this window out of the way. And you'll see that, it, that fast, my application is up in the cloud machine. Okay. I'm going to do what I said I was going to do a second ago. So here's a Firefox browser on the Linux desktop. We did create an alias for you. So if you wanted to, if you forgot what host name you created, for example, you could do Oracle Forms dash OCI colon 9001 slash form slash FRM server question mark config equals web start. See, the form will come up pretty quickly here. So there's my form. Oops. There's my form. So there's my 12214 form. What we're going to do is real quickly here. Oops. If I could learn how to type. One slash Oracle slash middleware. W Oops. Forms, forms, instances, forms one. Then, okay. So in the in the in the domain in the instances uh, area of forms, you'll find things like uh, the standard tools you'd find, the builder script, the compiler script, and so on and so forth. So what we're going to do is we're going to do frmcmp.sh module module equals slash home slash OPC slash Oracle slash forms module slash BI tester. And that particular form has no uh, database dependency, so I could do logon equals no. And if I type the path right, we should quickly get a module. And you can see if I go back, I now have an FMX. Exit. I go back to my Firefox browser and form equals BI tester. And look at that. Look how fast that came up. So that quickly, I got a form off of my local machine and into the cloud environment. So in all reality, I've been talking for just about 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes. And we got an instance running with a database, WebLogic server, forms, 
put a form mo a module on the machine and compiled it and ran it. That's pretty cool. Right. So I'm going to walk away from that real quick. I'm going to quickly go through this and then pass it back over to Pitts. Uh, I want to remind everybody that um, all product versions, Fusion Middleware versions older than 12.2, are no longer entitled to any kind of error correction support. So if you're not already running version 12, it's probably a good time to consider doing it. I know there's always concerns about security and compatibility on the latest platforms. And the only way you're gonna get that is to upgrade to the latest version. This is a great way to get started. You could get up on 12.214 in minutes. 12.214 right? is the only version entitled to error correction support. And most importantly, the lifetime support policy guide is not a representation of the life of a product. It is the representation of what support is available for a product. So the fact that you don't see version 14, 15, 16, 17 on here does not mean that version 12 is the last version of forms. It just simply means that version 12 is the last version that will get support in August, 2022. Okay. So we'll quickly go through the plan and this will help clarify what I just said. Again, 12.214 is the last plan release for the 12C family. The next major release is planned to be uh, made available sometime in calendar year 2021. We don't know exactly when right now. The release will be part of a broader Fusion middleware release, which means there'll be a new WLS, a new OHS, and all the, all the other pieces that go along with Fusion middleware uh, will all be part of the same family at that time in 2021. It is, unclear, it is unclear at this time whether or not reports will be included in it. However, it may be. However, I cannot guarantee that. So it's, again, probably a good idea to start having a plan on what you're going to do as an alternative. If reports is included, there will be no new features in it except for those which are absolutely necessary to make it compatible with the new version. Other than that, there won't be any new features. Using BI Publisher or Analytics Cloud Service is highly recommended instead of reports. So here are some of the features being considered for the next release of forms. This is not an all-inclusive list. It is just some ideas that we are playing around with. Uh, we are looking at data integration through REST, meaning you, from forms, you would be able to call out to a REST service and leverage that data inside your form. You would also be able to update that data as well. Get integration from the form builder for things like version control or integration with developer cloud service. Support for identity cloud service. So for example, if you currently use single sign-on with Oracle Access Manager on-premise and you wanted to use our identity cloud service, we're looking at adding support for it. It currently cannot be used. We are working on um, getting beyond that. Similar is true of autonomous database. Currently, you cannot use an autonomous database, but the ability to do that is potentially coming soon. A translation utility based on XLIF standards. We've had a lot of people ask about whatever happened to Translation Hub and Translation Builder. What do we do about translations? We are working on making a utility that is more standards-based available soon. And also being considered are lots and lots of user interface enhancements, talking about the runtime. And I'm going to show you just a couple real quickly. And again, some of these I showed at um, the DOAG conference last year, but I'll remind you of some of the cool stuff that we already have going on. So this is just a standard form. This is not a, an actual login dialog box. It's just a custom form in Canvas um, showing off some of the, the changes we're proposing. Um, the ability to optionally remove the title bar icon, the ability to have a um, show concealed data, like show password button. Uh, we're going to make those available on concealed data fields. Um, placeholder text, which is common typically in HTML5 and web applications. Uh, we're going to make that accessible to you. Ability to do things like set the border color of a text field. Kind of nice when you do things like enter an invalid password and you want to highlight to the user that there's a mistake in the field. You could uh, set, the, set the color. And rollover buttons. Uh, if you notice in the center picture, the bu button background is green and the text is white. But when I roll over it on the right side, you could see that the button background becomes white and the text becomes green. Uh, again, that concealed data um, button will carry over into our default dialog, so the login dialog and the change password dialog. We're going to add support for buttons and text on the, on the same button. We're going to add support to allow you to set the color of the current and the non-current tab label. And this one actually I think is going to turn out to be pretty cool. The ability to set uh, a custom message 
uh, down in the message bar that does not get overwritten by messaging that natively happens from form. So if you want to set something down in the bottom that says, you know, hi, this application is version one, you know, welcome to the show, that could potentially sit there through the life of the application, or you could programmatically change it later. Before we go into what Pitt has, does anyone have any questions very specific to what I just discussed here? Oops. All right, with that then, I will pass it back over to the PITS team and we'll catch up with all the questions at the end. Thank you very much, Michael. I think I might've run a little long, I apologize for that. Yeah, we split up a little bit, it's so interesting. So first of all, thank you very much, Mike, for this very interesting insight view and provision of benefits possible for, uh, I guess a lot of applications. I'm pretty confident that attendees saw that and realized the potential benefits for the project requirements and, and cloud planning as well. So awesome, uh, really cool stuff that you that you demonstrate like that. So to speed up uh, a little bit, your action is required now at this at this stage. I would like just to have a quick uh, poll, two quick polls where your action is required. I really appreciate uh, that we should go with this. Uh, let's have a quick look on this. Uh, well, we have a quick poll about change requests. So how often do you get change requests? Appreciate it. If you can tick the box, just have a quick look on that. We speed this up. It's always very interesting. I think for you as well, when you see the results, how vital is the development in forms in general. So, Thank you very much. Also very easy feedback on that. So I will go down to three, two, one, and zero just to end this and deploy the results. So you see really what development, continuously development, frequent development in your forms environment that we see here. Very good, very nice. And just uh, a final one, and the action section for you as well, uh, regarding development. So how many developers, how big are your teams here? Just tick the box as well. Just keep it open a few seconds. Appreciate your feedback. Thanks so much. And we see the results here as well. So yeah, so it's at the average size. Most developer teams here. Also huge, still huge developer teams and firms. Appreciate your feedback. Thanks so much. So, uh, well, let's move forward. Uh, Stefan, yep. I think he has a very interesting session as well. So, Stefan, your stage. Thank you very much. So, first of all, let's share my screen. That should be this one. Uh, warm welcome from my side as well. So, I just want to uh, run through only a couple of slides and have a live demo afterwards to see how we support the development in our cloud with the, with the Forms application. So first of all, um, we are very interesting in having um, the Oracle Forms application available in the marketplace. And that was a reason for us to, to uh, see what is necessary and how could we make that happen for uh, PITS as well. So what is necessary to bring the PITS installation, the PITS product uh, into the cloud uh, to see we do not only advise to do that and see that is a best practice for an forms application, but we as nice as we, we go this uh, for our future installation. And what is necessary for those who are familiar with PITS, we, you know we are usually tightly integrated into the development environment and uh, we are um, requiring uh, the forms modules and database uh, objects from a development environment. And to make that happen, we um, add our product with an integration to Git and Subversion. 
So we choose Git uh, because forms itself, you heard it a second ago from Michael, our plan to have a Git integration as well. So it makes sense if you check in the forms modules locally in your Git environment that we synchronize that with a Git client on the cloud machine and load then uh, directly uh, with the hook all these forms modules into our Pitscon repository. Same can be done with the development database. We provide a, uh, with the latest release of Pitscon an agent who extract all necessary data for all dependencies and development tasks as a SQL file, and that could be loaded into a version control system and with this synchronized with our installation. PITS itself comes along with the latest release as a mixture of forms application and a couple of new modules written in Apex. So the, we, for the forms module, that's a major part of our tool, we are still based on, on forms with uh, the standalone launcher. So what you will see in a second is running PITSCON on an Oracle cloud machine. Our cloud machine is located in Frankfurt uh, nearby. So um, there is uh, an installation uh, running and we use the standalone launcher to open that uh, application. From uh, the opportunities of having forms uh, available in the cloud, there are, we saw two different uh, viewpoints on this. From a viewpoint like we are as an ISV, we sell our software. Uh, it is very helpful to have a cloud machine available because it's easy to set up a demo or a trial version as we do in that webinar. Afterwards, you can register for a trial version. There's no installation longer necessary on-premise. You could directly use all components from Pitscon in cloud, and that's it's very, very good. For us, it's easy to maintain because we have directly uh, access to that machine. We could update, patch, bug fix, whatever uh, we, we want to do to improve our own software. And we could support the customer directly on their environment. It's more or less a shared environment for us and the customer. So you could decide when you are an ISV if you want to set up different compartments for each of your customer owned compartment or if you move your application into a multi-tenancy application so that multiple customers run on the same installation. Both make sense, are possible, and they have different point of views. For an in-house development, it's, but it's also uh, very interesting to set up a cloud machine for their forms development because you, you get rid of your hardware cost. If you migrate from an older forms version like 6i client server to cloud, uh, to, to forms web, you have to think about setting up a new database, setting up a new web logic server, think about a hardware concept. And so you could set up a very fast and, and uh, very brilliant uh, proof of concept in the cloud running with the latest forms version without any invest into hardware. Uh, and you can grow with your application. So that is a couple of, of good arguments, either if you are an ISV or uh, in-house development to do. If you are an in-house development uh, company and have a forms application running in-house, you are perhaps not so familiar with setting up a brand new fresh installation. That is what we often see. So what Pitscon helps is to re-platform your forms installation from your currently on-premise installation to a cloud environment. From top down, we know exactly once loaded into Pitscon, what are the objects which are necessary uh, for your application. We know all the dependencies. So we take care that no object from client side is missing. That could be easy for you. But more in depth, we, we take care about the database object as well. Perhaps if you use multiple schema or database links and all is necessary for, for your application, we, check that as well. And last but not least, there are perhaps a couple of scripts and files roundabout. You have scheduled jobs, starting SQL files, you have written own shell and batch scripts which have to be run in the environment. You set up a folder structure in the middle tier using different APIs, different interfaces. All those things could be identified with Pitscon. We have a very strong dependency check in our tool. So wherever there is uh, a reference given to any object and the object is missing and not part of the uh, loaded uh, repository of Pitscon, 
we will inform you that something is missing to re-platform your application. That helps a lot to have a fresh new installation and move everything which is necessary into the cloud environment. If you set that up, you step into a normal and usual um, day of a developer. So that is like an application lifecycle management or more like a software development lifecycle for your ongoing changes on the forms application. And I want like to show you how our tool set is able to support you by the day-by-day -day task and ease your development uh, for your forms application. So. If you take care about a typical lifecycle management, you start with an analyze stack. Perhaps you have to change a functionality in the forms module. You may touch a database object as well and a table as well. That is easy for you to cover. But the other way around is much more complicated. So if you want to check change a database backend functionality, you have to enhance a table or enhance a procedure with an additional parameter. It's no, not so easy to see where it's used inside your forms application. For this, we have a very strong dependency management and call stack visualization. Once started with the development, you could see there are a couple of really cool new features in the latest forms release, like perhaps the change in color schema to make the application a little bit more user-friendly with, with a fresh UI. But usually, you have to run through all your modules to change some hard-coded colors. And that is a typically part for Pitscon to change that in once. So that will be seen later on. Then afterwards, you have testing. How could you take care that all your code is really tested so that we provide a code coverage functionality and we take care about risk management and performance analysis as well. So let's go back from the uh, presentation and let's start uh, some demos. Um, what we do is um, we, we start with a very simple application uh, running in the cloud. It's a summit demo. I you believe all of you know that. I start the summit demo. The application is coming up on <coughs> the other screen. And that is, I believe everybody of you know that. Uh, I want to participate from the new color schema reforms. And it's a be look and feel color schema, but you see it's not really cool because there are so many hard-coded colors in the background of an item, of a canvas, etc. So that is, has to be changed. Okay, that is the task we want to start with. Let's go ahead from here and switch to uh, forms documentation. We, we try to help customers to have a good documentation on their forms application. So I, I started that application. It's part of Pitscon. You see, my summit demo consists of a couple of modules. There are six of them. Orders and customers are the well-known. You see the window title of that module. Let's see what's inside the orders module. A couple of our customers tend to have a, a static trigger on forms level to do all the documentation for the forms module. Uh, and we extract the commands of that static trigger uh, to make that readable, and you see here a link into a Jira port. You, you, I will come back to that later. What is, if you do not remember the orders module, what is it? You can take a look at the user interface, and you see a mockup we generated automatically from Pitscon with, um, with a tool called Balsamic. We integrate that into our tool. You see the live screenshot or mockup of that module orders. You could see, oh, yes, I remember, I want to, that is a module I want to take care about. And we have a couple of audit, um, audit rules. And besides changing the colors, let's see if we can do some uh, um, Boy Scout rules on, on our audit rules. And let's take care about perhaps a declaration, a misdeclaration of VACHA items. Let's see, is there anyone? Oh, yeah, there is an avoid uh, Vacha, there's really an old uh, uh, declaration of Vacha rather than Vacha 2. Let's create a ticket for the developer for that. So we have an integration into our Jira ticket system. I'd like to log into Jira account for a second. And let's take care about the token I generate. 
for this. Okay. So what you see is we have a demo test integration project set up and let's assign these one to myself. Okay, wonderful. So I create a ticket for that. So to change uh, the Varchar declaration in that, let's see, we just switch to our Kanban board and see, oh, there's a new uh, new I tickets arrived for that. Uh, this, the latest one, the uh, number eight, uh, I have uh, the functionality over here. And uh, okay, let's start with this. Uh, we save it and put them to into progress. And let's remember it's the ticket number eight. Okay. So let's go back to our Pitscon installation over here and start changing that behavior. What did we uh, check? We have a source code analytics running um, and we see a couple of rules which are auditable. Um, let's take care about the Varcha one. Ah, yes, there is. It's a when button pressed. Let's uh, edit the code. Let's see what the developer ones did. And you see over here, oh yeah, there's a misspelling. We missed the Vacha. I did it for Vacha 2 and save that. So the rule should be checked afterwards and, and should be fine. Um, the other one is I want to change all the colors in my application. So, uh, but before I do that, let's, let's put another command into our, uh, into our module. Uh, it's the trigger notes with all the documentation. Let's edit the note trigger. And you see I give a ticket over here with a shortcut of the ticket. And what I did is, okay, today it's the 12th of February uh, and it's a version number one perhaps. And the ticket is this one. We have ticket number eight as you remember and uh, change Varchar, something like that. Oh, got mistyped, no matter. Okay, and now we could take care about our colors. And for that, um, we set up a couple of projects because you have to reset a lot of colors. And I don't want to run through each and every property to change the color. I set up uh, a project which did all those, or which do all those things for me, uh, changing the colors of the block, of the canvas, of the items, etc. So I run the task, and in between, um, I see there are over 849 properties changed, and let's see what's, what's going on over there. Okay, before I put that into my production, I want to ensure that everything will be tested afterwards. So I insert a couple of cookie information into my application to later on track uh, the behavior of the application and see if all things that I changed are really tested. So let's do that. Uh, it's an application engineering. Uh, we call that as a user story. And what I do, uh, okay, do that over here. What I want to do is just for the forms, just only for the forms, I want to inject a couple of cookies into my forms application that is done. I set up 128 cookies uh, into my forms application. And now I'm ready to um, bring that to my production environment. You see over here, I have changed six modules and two object libraries. Okay, so please, in the first step, update those modules. They are written back into the forms modules and the FMV files. We have once loaded them into Pitscon and now they are changed in our repository with the properties, with the code I made, etc. And it doesn't matter if you change the modules inside Pitscon or if you do that in with your forms builder. You could do it as, a, as well, developing with the forms builder and bring them back to Pitscon afterwards, as I said before, during the JIT, uh, Git integration. Okay, so everything is updated. So to make that happen, I just want to compile the modules so that we have uh, all FMX files available. That is done so far. So now go back to my 
uh, demo that is over here. I just start, you see I'm running on a MacBook. I created a shell script to start the Java uh, form standalone launcher. I do that over here. The application is running. And now I move that over to the other side. Uh, okay. Oh, wait a second. Where is an error? Ay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a live demo I saw over here. Okay. Okay. So there is just one thing I miss in between. No matter, just go ahead and see what's going up in my environment over here. Um, let's go back to my forms documentation. What we see over here is the integration I saw in my orders uh, documentation, my newly generated document, and the shortcut of my Jira project is uh, created to a database link. So that is uh, over here. I could open that in a new tab and I directly bound to the appropriate Jira ticket. So there is a, a very good integration uh, for that if you want to uh, monitor your work with, um, with uh, Jira. And on the other hand, let's see in my documentation uh, from the code completion, with the um, cookie information we once generated, and if we use the application, we could see what is already tested by the user that is given in yellow colors, or if it's dedicated with the dedicated process done in the blue color. But we also see uh, the gray one, which is not yet tested. So uh, I can drill down over here to step into um, these object and that are all components, all cookies, which are not yet test, touched during my installation. And if I want to check if my image is just checked over here, I see, oh no, my user missed to uh, touch the image button. So my change for the declaration of Archer is not yet really checked. Uh, and I can go back to my customer and ask, please, could you please retest the image button in the orders module in the control block because you do not do that. And if he just record the story, he wants work with my application, uh, I could see over here in the code completion uh, that these objects going less and less and less. In the test environment, I could also check the performance. So if my application is running, I could see uh, which are the parts which consume most of my, um, of my time. And you see over here, most of the time is spent in the order modules rather than in the customer or in the pick module. So, but let's see in the customer module what's going on. Ah, in the customer module, I see most of them time is consumed in the navigator block rather than the control block or the S customer block. What's going on in the navigator block? Okay, you could see there is a when tree node selected, taking half of the time, which are spent in the navigator block. So during your testing phase and have the cookies available, you could see where is the time consumed and to see what is the slowest part after my migration and what are uh, the things which has to be improved. So that is the part we see. Let's go back to my slide for a second. Um, well, we see how we could support your life cycle of your forms application. We have a tightly integration in the Jira task. We do mass replaces and enhancement to be able to use really everything from the new feature of forms 12C. We take care in the testing phase over the code coverage that everything is really touched by the tester. We have a really good process documentation. Therefore, I, we, we uh, have a webinar later on in, in the next quarter. And we check the audit rules and do some performance analysis on that. So that is how we support uh, the uh, development phase from, from a forms application, even if it's running in the cloud. Uh, or on-prem. So to make that available for you, we spent uh, three 30 days test uh, trial and uh, environment for all those, or for the first ones who register 
uh, on the web page given in the chat. So that's from my side what I like to present. So I hand over back to Zasha for the Q&A session. Yeah, please do so. Okay. So, thank you very much, Stefan. You should see my slides now. Again, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, I think you, you all saw how easy it is, first of all, is to move to cloud, just a few steps as Michael demonstrated live. And uh, as Stefan just mentioned, you, you can give it a try for those topics that you, you just saw uh, about to maintain and develop in the cloud. And this is something that I would, or what we would like to offer to you is really a webinar special. So we make your first steps towards Oracle Cloud easier. So um, you have a chance to register uh, here at, uh, you get your, your free trial now. You can register at forms2cloud.pits.com. And what do you get? You will have a chance to test the full functionality of Pitscom in the cloud based on some of your modules. So we guide you through, we give you support. We have a couple of trials available, so uh, yeah, you have a chance ready to register now. And uh, while well, registration only available during the webinar, uh, sorry for uh, we spent too much time now here, but well, let's keep the registration open for one hour now. Take this chance. Uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that you can really benefit from this webinar. Special would be happy. Uh, yeah. To see your application really your form then in cloud using its functionality. Brilliant. Okay, as uh, Stefan mentioned uh, regarding QA, um, taking into account the time, uh, I propose that uh, we start now the QA session and uh, we will answer all the questions that uh, uh, we will focus on those that uh, we have received during the registration process already. And uh, I appreciate to all attendees uh, still are in the session. So Stefan, Mike, probably you get off mute as most of these uh, questions are for you. I have prepared some of those that we have received during registration. Okay, so will my users need the Java GRE installed to run forms in the cloud? Right, so all we've done is put forms in cloud. So exactly what you would see on premise, you will, would experience in cloud. We have not changed the forms product. All we've done is move it from your data center to Oracle's data center. So however you wanna run the client is entirely up to you. It does still require Java on the client. However, it does not necessarily need a JRE installed. It just needs Java on the client. So whether that's the JRE, the JDK, or the server JRE, um, any of those will work. Uh, in the case of the server JRE, that is not an installable, that is just a zip file you extract. So you do need Java on the client, but it does not necessarily need to be installed. Thank you, Mike. So uh, so quick question about forms and database compatibility. Yeah. So the the current forms version 12214 requires uh, a database of version 11.2.0.4 or newer. Uh, we recently added support for uh, the 19 database, 19.3. Uh, so basically all of the databases 11.204 and newer uh, will work with the current version of Forms. Thank you. Well, that's a, okay. Can I migrate my legacy Forms application to the AWS cloud using the YYOL option and installing Oracle WebLogic on PWS? Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question that, um, that's not uncommon. Um, you're certainly welcome to use uh, any other vendor's cloud. However, just keep in mind that um, you, you know, support in that environment becomes a little bit limited because it's, it's someone else's environment and we have no idea how it's expected to operate or not operate. Whereas if you put Oracle software in Oracle Cloud, we know what to expect, we know how to troubleshoot it, we know how to repair it if there's problems. And from a cost point of view, you may find that um, the, the cost of using Oracle Cloud likely in the end will be less expensive than any other vendor. Another one. Big 
we have here. So roadmap, forms, reports, web logic, just a statement here. Yep. So that I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, yeah. we are planning the next, the next release. Um, uh, we don't have too many details just yet, other than uh, we're planning to make it available potentially sometime in calendar year 2021. Cool. Will this work with an on-premise database? So, yeah. Let's, let's check the, a couple um, this, this was a question asked several times in, in the chat of the session, and the answer to that question is technically, yes, you can connect to your um, on-premise database. However, the likelihood that you will want to do that is is probably not high. Um, you will likely see a uh, you will likely see poor performance um, compared to using a, a more localized database. And then there's security concerns as well, right? How are you going to make the connection from cloud to your on-premise database? You're going to have to open up ports or make VPN connections, or um, you know use uh, Oracle provides some some other services that'll, that'll help make this work, but at the end of the day, you still have the same problem. Um, your database now has to be exposed in some way in order to do that, and, and quite honestly, I, I would not recommend doing that. Okay. So will forms reports both run on the cloud? What about calls for legacy local apps? Uh, example like Views for Word, Excel PPT, can they still be called? Um, so I'm not really sure I fully understand the question, but at least part of that question, can forms and reports both run in cloud? Um, technically, both forms and reports can run in cloud. However, as I mentioned a few times, reports was not certification tested in cloud, and therefore we cannot guarantee that it will work problem free. Um, and again, support for using it in that space may also be limited. In other words, if there is a problem that only reproduces with reports in cloud, but it does not reproduce on premise, um, the development team uh, has the right to um, to not um, fix the problem if it's not feasible to fix, I guess the best way to describe it, so. Okay, well, thanks. So what is the recommended process to migrate forms to the cloud? Another question here. Stefan. What is recommended for some migrate forms on cloud? Um, so the similar similar kind of answer. Um, there's two parts, there's two parts to so-called migrating forms to cloud. Um, I just showed you how to get the environment in cloud. I don't know if that is considered a migration, um, but that that's one way in which you could stand up your environment in cloud. Uh, as far as your application goes, I think I actually showed you that as well. Um, just do exactly as you would do if you were on-premise moving from machine A or server A to server B. Copy the modules to the new machine, generate them, and off you go. So, I mean, there really is no migration per se. It's just moving your application from A to B. The technology that we're using in cloud is not new. It is exactly the same forms installation that you have on-premise. We've just done all the work for you so that you could have it up and running faster. So what the easiest way to bring my legacy forms uh, application to cloud? And, it's, uh, right, so again, same so same kind of answer, right? Yeah. So it, if if you're running version uh, versions nine, ten, eleven, or twelve, in in most cases, you should be able to take those modules right now, drop them into this version twelve environment that I just illustrated to you, generate them, and run them. In the case of the earlier versions, let's say version nine or ten. There may be some minor code changes necessary, but for the most part, they will just run. If you're coming from client server, then the same upgrade process would apply regardless of whether we're talking about on-premise or uh, cloud. And we do have a, an official document that talks about specifically that topic. How do I get from 6i um, or older to the latest version? And in that document, it explains um, all the details on doing that. And that's in the, the, the documentation library for Forms 12. And I'll share that link in the chat in just a, a second. Yeah. And if you want to avoid the couple of manual steps uh, on that way from 6i on 9 and 10 to the latest version, there are also a couple of projects available with Pitscon to speed that up and, and make that very easy. 
Exactly. That's a good point, Stefan. Um, with with PitsCon, you should be able to upgrade in a much in a much easier fashion, especially if you're coming from earlier versions. Exactly. So, a question about our report service available in the cloud, but phased out for the publisher. Well, phased out. Okay. Uh, so the installation, as I mentioned, is a complete uh, Fusion Middleware 12314 installation. So forms and reports are both installed. However, in the domain that we create for you, reports is not configured. If you want to use reports, you could extend the domain and add reports, but the rest the rest I've already explained because reports is deprecated, it's not configured, um, do it at your own uh, risk. And of course, BI Publisher is, is an option or analytics cloud service, which includes BI Publisher is a cloud solution uh, as opposed to installing BI Publisher. So cost to convert legacy forms to cloud. So I mentioned there really is no concept of converting forms to cloud. It's still, you're, you're moving forms to forms. So you're not doing anything different. If you're talking about upgrading from an old version to a new version, Again, that has nothing to do with cloud. That's just upgrading from version, whatever version you're on, to the current version, which is 12214. Whether you do it on premise or cloud is irrelevant. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. So, how secure is it? And is the data shared? No, of course, the data is not shared. The database. The database is entirely yours. Essentially, what you're doing with cloud is your. Um, I don't want to use the word hosted, but I guess it's a good way to describe it. The machine is yours and only yours. The virtual machine is yours and only yours. Um, the data is not shared. Uh, your usage is not shared. Your application data is shared. We don't even have access to your environment. It is entirely yours to do with as you please. However you want to lock it down or unlock it, that is entirely your choice. If you want to open every listener port to the entire planet, that is entirely your choice. If you want to lock everything down, that is entirely your choice. We have no access to your data. So if you lose your data, it's still your data and you lost it. We have no way to recover it for you. Okay. okay. And how will form be run? So the browser option is simplified and it's not the solution for us. So right now you have two options that do not include a browser. One is the form standalone launcher. The other is Java Web Start. Um, Java Web Start is uh, currently planned to be supported until approximately 2030. That's 2030. Um, so at least 10 years from now. Um, so we've got quite a long ways to go with Java Web Start. Yes. And of course, standalone is is kind of the preferred way forward. Okay. Is Forms useful in cloud? I don't, I don't really know the answer to that question, yeah. but what I do know is that based on unofficial experimentation and testing that my team has done, the performance that we're seeing out of these cloud instances far extends beyond what we could see on any on-premise server. And I'm, I, I say that as, as the person doing some of the testing and not just the person that works for Oracle. The performance we're getting off of these environments in cloud is unbelievable. Um, part of the reason I'm sure is because of the high-speed networking that we have on the back end. Um, some of it is just the nature of how these environments are set up on the hardware that they run on, but in general, having, uh, having this environment is definitely uh, going to be a, a value add. And of course, the most important thing is, um, I mean, as most of you know, as you go from version to version, almost always moving to a new version is going to require some hardware change either more disk space or more memory or, or whatever it is, by doing it in cloud, you have the ability to change that with a click of a button. And it's, um, it's definitely a way to avoid the cost of all the hardware that goes into the ongoing maintenance that, that comes along with owning and operating software. Okay. So uh, there is how migrate library is used in Windows and Unix environments. Um, I'm not sure which kind of libraries we're talking about. If we're talking about forms module libraries like PLLs, PL SQL libraries, they're platform independent. So um, those source files can be moved from any platform to any platform. If we're talking about actual um, C libraries, those would have to be recreated for the platform that they're running on. If they're running on the client machine, like with WebUtil, then nothing changes. If they're running on the server, 
then you have to have a you know a library obviously compiled for that platform. Okay. Connectivity problems, a statement. Um, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm I'm not sure what that means. I mean, connect any connectivity problems you have is just the nature of you know your client machine reaching out to some public machine in our case cloud right do you have, do you have a connectivity problem between your machine and oracle's website oracle.com or google.com or, or any other public website if you have connectivity problems there then you might have problems connecting to oracle's uh, cloud but that has nothing to do with um, the cloud technology that's just strictly between you and your your network access and i think there is a final one for you uh, but only for today michael <laughs> <laughs> How long will Forrest long survive? <laughs> uh, I always I always joke and I say I'm still working, so I guess I guess Forms is still pretty healthy. Um, here, here's there's no way to answer that question, and no vendor of any product can can answer that question, right? How how long will the current model of a Mercedes, la, uh, you know, be made in production? We don't know. That's a decision that happens, you know, on on the spot based on business decisions. So I cannot say how long Forms will be around for. But what I can tell you is this. The current version is supported until August 2022 and extended support until August 2025. The next major release is already being developed. Once it's released, you can probably anticipate the same kind of support model, five years premier support plus two years extended. The likelihood is that that will take us you know, well into or approaching 2030. Um, E-Business Suite, which still runs on forms, is supported until, until 2030. Um, until at least another release comes out. So um, the likelihood is that the next 10 or more years will still see forms in it. Uh, but again, there's no guarantee as to what, you know, what the future may bring. Um, uh, unfortunately, we just cannot answer that question. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. So, uh, well, I'm, I'm aware that uh, we could not address all of your questions or answer all of your questions, but, but we promise that we will go back and come back to you. Uh, we answer all the questions that also came up during the session. Uh, so this will be documented in the follow-up. We will provide some more information. Uh, so the answers to the questions, uh, we will have a recorded version available of the session. And again, a summary of the feedback of all the colleagues that you did this session. And uh, just to mention again, uh, we had more than 200 registrations with only a few not attending, and the, which is really incredible. And so we know how important this topic is. And uh, yeah, we are we are here to help. So a quick outlook probably to the next sessions for those who are interested in, would be happy to welcome you. We already scheduled one in March 11th, same time, same location. We talk about Oracle Forms to Apex. Um, Yes, and another one in April, already scheduled for April, but not final date time uh, confirmed, but we keep you updated on this. So we'd be happy to welcome you here again. So at this stage, uh, Michael, Stefan, thank you very much for your awesome presentations. Um, to all of you joining today, a big thanks for your interest and time spent with us. Uh, we are really looking forward to meeting you uh, by the way, have I mentioned the webinar special? <laughs> you have a chance now still for registering. Uh, the registration site is kept open. Yes, within the next hour. So thank you very much. Have a great day or a nice evening wherever you are. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs>